So I just still working. Um, October 16th, 2019, and this is the meeting of the Community Resources Committee of the Council. It is 8.38 a.m., and I'm calling the meeting to order. Um, people might notice a change in chair. Last meeting, the Community Resources Committee elected me, Mandy Jo Haneke, chair, so I will be chairing starting today. Um, we start with general public comment. Um, is there any? <laughs> so there is not. If some public shows up later in the meeting, I may come back to, to that item. Um, so our first discussion item is the draft affordable housing priorities policy. Um, we have a duty to report back to the town council on a feedback on this policy. So what I did was draft, started a draft memo. I do not believe it is in any way complete. Um, but I started it based on the conversation we had at the last meeting and I took the minutes from that meeting and attempted to sort of coalesce that into feedback that was standardized in form and wording and stuff as much as possible. Um, and so what I thought we would talk about today is, in addition to the form, is this a good idea on how to present this back to the Affordable Housing Trust? Um, but also, what do we want to add? What do we want to subtract if this isn't great? All of that. Um, before we start, I want to make sure everyone has it. I can view a copy of it. You're working on your computer still, right? <laughs> we, we will help you find it um, once you get your computer up and running. Um, oh, there it goes. So let's get it plugged in and, and we'll pull it up. Um, Now that we've got everyone on the same page, and you've potentially seen this in the audience, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, we're talking about the memo that is in draft form right now and very basic. Um, so let's talk first about just quickly form. Or we can start with anything people want, but um, Andy. Yeah. Um, remember who? had several questions for the, um, you as chair for the group. And that is that uh, there were a number of issues that were raised, uh, questions that were raised in the committee discussion about the proposed policy um, and uh, 
So I guess my questions were, was there any prioritization in the way they were presented? And are, was it put together so that if one member of the committee raised an issue as listed, is there any way to tell um, whether there was broad support or just a single person raising an issue for it to be listed? Um, the way I put it together was if it was in the minutes, it went into this memo as a basic, here's what was recorded. So whether it was one counselor or many, it's in this memo, which is why we need to talk about what we should put in it, whether we want to delete stuff, whether we want to add stuff and all. Um, but at this point, it's if it was mentioned, I tried to put it in the memo to be as inclusive as possible. Okay. So thoughts on whether that should be the case would be welcome. Yeah, I think we would need to come to just a group understanding, given the fact that it's a small committee. And it's, it was obviously a very thoughtful discussion, because there was nothing that I would have thought to raise had I been here that wasn't included. Um, I think that it's important to get it all there. Um, but I guess the we do have to, as a group, come to that next question that you're raising as to whether prioritization is something that we need to do as a group. Well, I, I haven't had a chance to read this, which looks very interesting. Um, I know that I woke up having thoughts about housing and places where I have lived. And um, I guess my concern is that um, some of this is leading towards, um, I guess it's 40R. Um, and I, I went to one of those information pro uh, programs and <clears throat> I did not see the examples as being things that I wanted uh, in the downtown of Amherst. We don't have, um, housing for reuse. I, I think the only example might be the East Street School, which may or may not be retained depending upon um, the person who um, ends up <coughs> coming onto that property to develop it. Uh, we don't have the big old factories, which have uh, really create such wonderful opportunities, say, in East Hampton. Um, I, the idea of, of a, an apartment building such as the um, Brickyard in Northampton in downtown Amherst as family housing <clears throat> is upsetting to me because there is no community space, no outdoor space, and um, I don't see uh, how that really gets us where we want to go. Um, I lived many years in New York City. I taught in the Bronx. Um, I know that when I was there, the Bronx was moving away from what truthfully what we just call projects, and projects did were in fact located in pieces of grass. They had big areas of grass around them to make up for their height. Um, and they were moving towards what you would call defensible space, defensible housing. They were moving into small row houses because they felt that that was safer and people would have a sense of property and ownership. And you would also have that little piece of land where you could at least put a chair or plant a few flowers uh, or a vegetable, or have a kid dig a hole. And um, I think that we have a, um, the master plan is one of its aims was to avoid um, suburban sprawl. <clears throat> and I think we're going maybe in the wrong direction. Um, I don't think anyone wants suburban sprawl, but there are ways of doing houses, um, row houses, small row houses, <clears throat> some of the suggestions in one of the um, housing uh, studies that was done before, uh, where there is, the lot sizes are smaller. There are smaller houses. Um, I see that as a better direction to go and uh, for families, and we have such housing in Amherst. Uh, we have housing where there is grass around it, um, where they're two or three stories tall, and there's a sense to have community. I mean, we saw this last week with the people from um, North Village. 
We all know those houses are old and run down and not attractive, but they really didn't care because it was the layout of the community that mattered. They had space and the children had places to walk and to run. People had a chance to mix and mingle and to interact and to get to know each other and to form the bonds that make a community. So um, I just want to, I, I understand the need to, to think of housing, but to me they're not units, uh, they're homes and I, I want there to be uh, the ability to have community, and I think we have some better examples in Amherst than some of the houses I saw at the hearing, um, the, the forum on 40R houses. So I, I just wanna bring that back to, I feel like my mic is not on, is it? Is it there? Can you guys, it, is it? Okay, because it, it does not sound like hers, yeah. Um, right, and so it doesn't sound like it's on. Um, Let's bring it back to what we're discussing today, which is the feedback we need to provide or recommend providing. We go back to the council with some feedback of what we discussed, and then that goes back to the council will adopt something that goes back to the Affordable Housing Trust. So can we bring what you just summarized and talked about to back to how that might look in feedback for the housing, the draft housing priorities policy that that we've been talking about. And, and well, I, think I don't want to put words in your mouth, so I'm saying can we get that into Right, some of this is, is, is responding to some things in the master plan about increasing density downtown. And so, um, and, and it's trying to, to, to create affordable housing with that in mind. So I guess what I wanted to do was to question whether that goal was still the goal that we wanted in the master plan. Um, other aspects of this about setting aside having a, an easier way of dealing with um, uh, affordable housing by having just a numbers count, I think that's good. Um. Oh, Pat. It might not help. Uh, <clears throat> where it's, uh, it says the affordable housing policy should consider policies related to UMass and the housing of students on and off campus. I I'm I'm, um, would love to have a little bit more information because it's not clear to me that we have any impact on what UMass does um, and how it affects housing prices. So I don't quite see how it fits into the policy. So I'll, I'll address that one because oh, I think I'm, I'm the one that talked about that last meeting. Okay, great. Um, and, and I wasn't sure how to word it on here. My, my thoughts were if we're looking at an affordable housing policy and the council's seeking to adopt something like that, a policy that doesn't even address how to talk to UMass about what they're doing. Yeah, we might not be able to affect them, but a, po a policy that doesn't address that part of housing seemed to me missing something. Now that addressing might be, we know we need to react to what they're doing, but if they do or don't do something, our plans might have to change, or maybe it's just, we need to be in conversation with them to keep up with. And so I don't know whether, I don't know how to word it in here, but it was more of, there seemed to be a glaring absence of even stating that a lot of our affordable housing policies probably are affected by what UMass is doing or in an attempt to potentially cre create and sort of craft out a section of housing that might not be available to students, you know, and, and so there might need to be policies or somehow to research into can we create zoning or, you know, restrictions that are age-based maybe or, or something to, and I, I don't know, you can do that for seniors in some, in some states, you know, and so can you do that for other things? I don't know, but maybe there's, maybe a housing priorities policy needs to address that just that elephant in the room to me and staying silent seemed to be missing. So I don't know if it's worded well here, maybe it needs a rewording, but um, let's have us our conversation okay. and then we can bring John up um, for commenting. Yeah. 
Um, yes, that's been a question. There, there have been some housing uh, where somebody has, a developer has said, not for students. And I remember my husband said, I don't think you can do that. You know, just say students can't, can't live someplace. But um, I think we could think about um, integrated housing. I mean, we have many students who live among, in my neighborhood uh, in the individual private homes. And um, they all behave very nicely when they're living amongst families and, and, and senior couples. Um, there's a new development in Sunderland. I think it's called 116 North, which uh, may have been done with 40R, uh, but it's not in the middle of the downtown. Uh, it's got a big piece of property. It is selling itself as being right up the road from UMass. It talks about uh, housing for students, a workforce housing. 25% of it is affordable housing. They have a huge uh, 8,000 square foot like social hall as part of it. They have um, grounds, uh, amenities, places for people to do things. Um, so there, uh, it's obviously it's going to be families, some student families, some non-student families, some worker families, and students. And it might turn out that this could be a, a good community model. Uh, putting all students together all at once might be, it, I think we've seen that that creates crazy things on the weekends. Dave. I'd love to take a few minutes on that project, but I, I think my thought on, I know exactly where that project is in Sunderland. I think um, time will tell as to who lives in that, in that um, complex. The one observation I would make, um, and I think you alluded to it, Dorothy, is that um, it is not in a village center. It is, this is the one right off of 116 as you're going north. Right. And from a, from a sustainability standpoint, I would kind of question why there, but anyway, that's Sunderland and that's, 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 their, that's their project. I just wanted to go back to a couple of things just on master planning and just a couple of things to keep in mind as, as we move through this discussion with John and the, and the trust. A couple of things that I talk about a lot with my staff. Um, so one thing we've got to remember is, is um, the land base is finite in Amherst. We only have so many acres and so many acres of that land is already spoken for in a way, either owned by the university, Amherst College, Hampshire College. Um, the state owns a lot of land in South Amherst on the Mount Holyoke Range. We've protected a lot of land for farming uh, long term and we've protected land for conservation. So to me, that's a limiting factor and we have to keep that in mind. Um, to me, density, as we look at global climate change, as we look at the way uh, our planet is going, density to me equals sustainability. We cannot keep growing and we, we talk about sprawl and so anytime we extend sewer lines, we extend water lines beyond already existing water and sewer lines, to me, we just need to think about that. Is that where we want to go with growth? Um, um, so density to me is all about um, energy conservation. You know, the, the more people we can put downtown and in village centers, the less we have to extend water lines, sewer lines, electric lines, gas lines, et cetera, et cetera, and the list goes on. And then lastly, and, and John and, and I and Nate Malloy and others have talked about costs. So when you're talking about um, affordable housing, any kind of housing, the more units with, think about walls, the fewer walls you need to build or the, or the number of walls you can share with multiple units saves money. So therefore you can make housing more affordable across the board, whether it's market rate housing or affordable housing. So every time we plop an individual house on a piece of raw land, all of those expenses are tremendously greater than if you do four units or eight units or 16 units. So that's the way people in affordable housing think um, and that's the way we all should be thinking is how many units can we build um, together to keep the cost down? Because every time we add something, think of it as uh, branches on a tree. Every time we extend the branches, the costs go up 
and the environmental costs go up as well. So that's kind of the way we think about it in planning and, and working with the Affordable Housing Trust and, and uh, groups like Valley CDC and, and Wayfinders and, and the state. Pat. Just as an aside, as an elderly person, um, I, if I were not going to stay in my home, I'd want to be downtown where I could walk, really walk to the bookstore and uh, to the library and things. So I think that broad generalizations about any of Amherst population, we need to let go of as much as we can to address issues of sustainability, address issues of choice and things like that. Well, that was one of the topics that Steve brought up, that he thought he would like to live downtown too, but that's not what's been built. What has been built is a place that most seniors would find attractive downtown. So I think we're getting a little bit away from this discussion. Um, that will come back as we're, we throw, bring ourselves into a discussion on master plan, but let's get back to feedback on the policy, the priorities policy that has been presented to us that we have to get back to the council. Andy. Yeah, now this has actually been a very interesting discussion because Dorothy's brought up the point about what is the nature of the housing that would really be attractive and then David brought up the question that had gotten to my mind as she was speaking which is questions of density and land use and what we have available in use. I think that the uh, question ultimately that we've got to come to grips with if we're dealing with uh, comments on this policy is, is it practical to set a numerical goal? And uh, I say that because uh, to set a numerical, if you really want to achieve a numerical goal, probably need to make some compromises on some of the issues that have been discussed. What those compromises are is going to be a combination of discussion that our planning department needs to have along with who develops housing and what they say is feasible and what they advise us is feasible because we can't, we're not in the business of building housing. It's not our area of expertise and we need to call in that expertise and pair it with the planning department to see what you can affordably build that will achieve the numerical goal if you are going to set a numerical goal. I guess the other thing that I've thought about that is, is that um, as I've looked at what we have done successfully um, here to create affordable housing in Amherst, and we've really had some great successes, and I think we need to uh, both be proud of our successes but also look at what led to them, and it was seizing opportunities. It was not that we always created the opportunities but uh, there were things that were happening in sort of combinations of circumstances. Uh, Rolling, uh, Rolling Green uh, and the fact that it became available and that um, we could combine forces with Beacon and that we could uh, look for CPA money and um, put together a package and that we had uh, some incredible staff support in making that all those pieces come together created success uh, as far as uh, things like uh, using the tax incentive program for uh, the other Beacon um, partnered project it was also because it was a developer who had a piece of land that um, was uh, the right place to be able to put something. So there was again a combination of circumstances, but it was a seized opportunity. It wasn't one that we necessarily um, could have created all on our own, but it was because there were others who were coming forward and we said, hey, we can use this and leverage affordable housing. 
what we're thinking about in East Street School is sort of similar, but again, a different set of circumstances. Uh, so it isn't the numerical goal that got us there, it was the opportunities that got us there and the fact that we were able to uh, take hold of those opportunities. And what we want to do is to create a climate that says we look for those opportunities and we will go after them and do whatever we can to make them work when they are there. And it's uh, creating a community will that it is our goal to do that. Dorothy. Uh, I, I think those are really good remarks and it, it reminds me that we have we do have a lot of good examples, and um, uh, Wayfinders seems to be a great group. Uh, and I've, I've been to Olympia Oaks, and um, I think it's the, it, I don't know the exact name, but there's another place that they have a farm down south, in the southern Amherst. How, how, do they come to us? Do we go to them? How do we, how does, how does a project with Wayfinders come about? That's my question. Well, a project like Olympia Oaks is a project where the town worked with the university. That was a that was a twenty five year project, but um, even for affordable housing, that's a that's a long one. But it was complicated working with with the um, with the with the university. But in the end, yeah, we we brought uh, invited wayfinders uh, to the table and and. So we had a combination of collaboration between the university, the town, and Wayfinders. Um, but a lot of times it is, as Andy said, it's seizing that opportunity, it's, it's bringing, uh, recognizing there is an opportunity, whether it's Olympia Oaks, Rolling Green, um, North Square, it's recognizing the town being aware and, and, and seizing that opportunity. I have a, um, I moved to Amherst uh, to live in the Pomeroy Lane Cooperative when it first opened. And I know that it had been created by abodes of parents who had adult children with cognitive and physical disabilities. I don't want to take us too far off, but it meets many of the criteria. It was com community, open space, small amount of property, 25 families. Um, I guess I would love to know how that particularly developed because it felt like it was an outgrowth of real need of parents who lived in Amherst um, and possibly other areas who were working together. Do you have any information about that? And if it's too far afield, um, I'm just really curious. Um, Dave, do you? It predates me working <laughs> for the town, but I think there's a, there's a common thread in all of these, whether we look at that cooperative or whether we look at um, the co-housing at Pulpit Hill Road. You know, people, individuals want to see something, uh, something happen in town. And if there's a receptivity, and as Andy said, there's, there's a willingness to seize opportunity, I think that makes all the difference in the world. Um, the idea of mixed income because the families were market rate section eight and a four, um, low income and it was an incredible community that developed very similar to North Village in terms of how we cared for one another um, so I could just one thing to add Mandy and that is it's really important to keep in context here um, housing markets and um, like it or not um, those drive, the market drives what is built in any town. We can seize opportunities and, and, and I think, you know, not, I think part of this policy effort is to really articulate that we are a town that believes these things and that we will take aggressive steps to move in that direction um, and, and be a player 
I don't want to put John, words in John's mouth, but be, be an aggressive, assertive player in that market. Um, people ask me all the time, why don't we have more senior housing? Why don't we have senior affordable housing? The simple answer here, I think, is market. Um, if there was a market for it where people could make a profit, um, we would have more senior housing. And the bottom line is people have looked at that and we have, we have uh, encouraged them to look hard at that. And up until now, there, other than Applewood, Upper Orchard, um, the market has not been strong in, in that sector of our housing. In, uh, of our housing. So um, we've encouraged it. We are still encouraging it, but um, it, the private sector has not said, oh, we're going to come in here and build 200 new units of housing specifically for seniors or retirees. You may recall that Hampshire College took a, took a stab in this direction with Viridian Village. Unfortunately, the market crashed. So um, they spent a tremendous amount of money. They had, uh, I think it was 130 units, 180 units, I can't remember, off of 116. They spent a tremendous amount of money designing it. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Beacon was working with them. And the economy, uh, their, their price points were very high because of cost. And then the economy tanked and there went a retirement community that could have been a taxable large development for Amherst. So market makes all the difference. So great discussion. Um, we're aiming for a vote at the next meeting, which is next week on a memo of some sort or a feedback thing. I've been taking notes on this one, my notes, and I'm just going to run through my notes from what I've gotten through this discussion to change and modify on this memo, um, we would go back and delete any, any section that doesn't have items in it. Um, but under the third point in defining affordable housing and unit goals, the, is it a practical numerical goal is what I heard Andy talking about. Um, something about seizing opportunities versus just encouraging developers to build um, and adding some of that into that, it might end up getting split into a couple of different numbers. Um, the, the next one under project evaluation criteria, based on what um, Dorothy was saying, uh, things about is it possible to include in the criteria community bu building aspects of a design of a project, you know, things that would help, can that be part of how we decide whether to fund a project? Um, in the general feedback, revisit number eight, the UMass and housing of students and figure out a way to reword that to better communicate what I'm trying to, to get at with referencing the university and all. Um, those are what I've got right now. Um, is there anything that is listed here or drafted here that, that this committee seeks to delete? Let's, let's see if there's anything people wanna say, no, I actually don't want this listed. Um, you know, like I said, I included everything, including community member comments on this, um, but even things that w were like the UMass thing that's a one counselor comment, are there stuff that we don't feel we should forward on to the council as potential feedback to the trust? Dorothy. Do we have in here that um, a straightforward uh, requirement of 15% affordable housing under defining affordable housing unit and goals on the first page, the very first number talks about um, potentially, oh no, that's the 15 AMI. Yeah. Sorry, that's the wrong one. Um, so in general feedback, number nine, so the very last thing, I, I listed as examples in the member of the public comment, um, increasing minimum percentage of affordable housing. If you want me to pull that out as a counselor comment, I can certainly do that. Well, it's, it's, it's I'm, I'm looking at this quickly, but it's, it's a complicated paragraph. I, I thought just a, a really simple, straightforward one that, that new housing, that 15% be affordable, 15% um, in, in, I guess, units or space. 
because the what we have now is so it's complicated and nobody's using it. I, I, I will pull that one out as a separate item. Just to, I was just thinking, the, the number 250 is daunting. So I'm thinking of kind of uh, inch by inch, day by day, you know, kind of like we could, if we do a lot of little things, we might get somewhere close to that number. Yeah. Pat? I think having that number is very important. <laughs> I'm different than Andy. I think, I think it is achievable, and I think, um, but it's critical that we have a goal, and I'd actually like to see it larger and uh, be a more flexible definition. Would you like me to put in there, right now it's counselors have, I can put some counselors, I, we, we can hedge that so that some want higher, some want, you know, but I'll. I'll yeah. no, I think it might be important to note that, that for that one, there are concerns m multiple directions. Um, Yes, Dorothy. So I'll work on some creation of that paragraph. Yes, Andy. Yeah, I mean, it's worth having a numerical goal, even if it's aspirational, um, because you then are reaching to something. But. Uh, I think we don't want to set up a numerical goal that is, um, puts us in a position of having a policy that then we say we failed. I think that's the danger of putting in a numerical goal is that um, you may not reach it, but uh, as long as it, it doesn't have a timeline to it, um, which is, or, just have to go back and look at it to make sure it doesn't have a time limit to it, but that's where the question of an aspirational goal turning into something that you're setting yourself up for potential failure is really then a more significant problem. Uh, so and these are, and, and the other thing I was just gonna yeah. respond to that was said is uh, reference was made to Butternut Farms, and I, um, I think if we ask Connie Kruger, who was working for the town and the planning department at the time that that was built, um, how complicated it was the level of uh, neighbor um, opposition to it, the litigation that resulted, the length and cost of the litigation, those were all huge pieces that you really need to understand the level of perseverance it takes to decide <clears throat> you're gonna do something like that and um, the uh, willingness to uh, confront neighborhood opposition even if it's defending a lawsuit that neighbors bring those are all things that have political consequences that a council that's elected by the public needs to be aware of as it delves into a policy. These are not easy things always to achieve. Dorothy. I think you have somewhere um, near the top um, the concern about people at the um, uh, bottom of the income level, uh, I guess I would think of it, people, people who are on disability or SSI, um, at that income level, there's almost no housing. Um, and one of my questions, I don't have an answer yet, is whether it is better to um, have some units at that income level, um, maybe two or three or just scattered throughout whatever new construction there is or whether it's better to have it together. I don't know the answer to that yet, but it's, it's something I'm thinking about. But we, 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 if people have a disability and get a disability check and that's what they live on, then I, I can't, there has to be places for them to live in the town. 
And not to have that is, I think, just really bad. Okay. I'm not hearing too much about things we should delete from this. Are we missing some feedback? Is there stuff that counselors here want to see added into this feedback at this point? beyond what I've noted to change for next week. Pat. <laughs> well, I'm not sure where this goes. And um, after uh, the last meeting where we did as a council um, or, or after one of the Hickory Ridge public comment period, I was talking to do two gentlemen outside and one of them said to me, affordable housing, that's really public housing, right? It's public housing. And I said, no, I think it's more complicated than that. And, it's for, and he said, well, you know what that means. And it means that we'll have people from outside of Amherst moving here. And my response was, and, and we'll benefit from all that creativity and energy and intellect. What I'm getting at is there's a great deal of prejudice in Amherst about, this, about affordable housing. Um, and I think that somehow or other in the policy, we need to make some kind of statement about what our, our beliefs or values are. Because uh, I'm kind of getting tired of uh, new coded ways of expressing disdain for a variety of people. So I think I'll attempt to add something into the comments for the introduction part of the policy to talk about um, more of that, yeah. I'll come up with wording for next week, yeah. Mm -hmm. Anything else we feel is missing from this? Andy. I guess the one thing that um, is touched on really briefly in number five, counselors are asking for more explicit link to the master plan. We need to look at what the master plan says about uh, the type of housing and um, who we want to encourage to be a part of our community, a subject that Pat has brought up. And that has to be a part of the master planning conversation because master plan is the larger vision of what we want our community to be. And uh, so I would strengthen that statement, uh, be a little bit more explicit about um, making sure that we create a community conversation to make sure that there's really a uh, will and an interest uh, in the community to have the kind of a community that has the diversity of housing that is envisioned. Uh, basic draft was, I just added to the end of that sentence at this point, and I can refine it. So it would read, counselors are asking for a more explicit link to the master plan and to creating a community conversation to ensure that there is a will in the community to have the diversity of housing and residents that are envisioned by the plan. I, th I think I got sort of what you were referring to, Andy. I think that's right, and I yeah. think Pat's nodding, and I think whatever <laughs> that is. <laughs> And any other comments on this at this time? It will be back next week for a final review, revision, and hopefully vote to send back to the council as our sort of final thing. Yes, Dorothy. You know, building housing is one thing. Running housing is another. And I guess that's part of where my concern is. In groups where, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, Wayfinders, again, there seems to be an ongoing 
role in running that community. Um, I lived in an affordable housing in Staten Island once, and the apartment was lovely, the size was great, but it was a terrible experience, and it's one I had to run from for my life, I felt. Um, there was, it was just not being run, I don't know where the people were who were supposed to be running it. All the, the front door locks were broken all the time. There were um, drug addicts in the elevators, and then there was a murder. Um, and that's when I said I'm not living there anymore. The, the house was wonderful. The, I mean, the apartment house, it was great, but it wasn't run. I just want to attempt to potentially close this up. Do you have something before? Okay. Um, we're going to bring this back next week. Um, I didn't have a chance to talk to Andy. He's chair of finance committee, and I know this has been referred to finance committee, and this is something we as a committee of CRC might want to discuss too. This one has from Amherst Town Council dash community resources committee. I envision potentially at some point the town council coming up with one document um, I don't know where we as a CRC fall on forwarding this. When, when is finance taking up this discussion? Well, we're going to take the discussion up next week, and uh, we're a little bit behind because we had some right. other major things right. that were going on. But I think that we're going to try and not talk about housing policy, but what would be financially required from the community to make this happen and um, mm -hmm. what choices we would have to make in order to allow that to occur. Uh, and that's probably going to be the focus and sort of being on both committees is, and I'm not the only one, Dorothy's on both committees yeah. too. Uh, in the end, it's the council that's going to then take the financial considerations and the housing policy considerations that come out of this committee and try and put it together into a cohesive set of uh, comments as to whether this is something as presented initially that we can get on board with or what changes we would like to see as a council and that's where it has yeah. to come together. I, I, I guess where I was, I, this one was drafted as sort of a, a midway between just a CRC memo, but also something that the town council could potentially adopt, which is why it's technically addressed to the Affordable Housing Trust and not the town council as a whole. Um, I don't know whether Finance Committee wants to take a stab at just adding to the end of this or putting its comments into that or you'll, you'll have to as, as chair think about how you want to get finance committee's response you know feedback back but it could potentially be an addition to this memo at some point in time um, one way or another the two have to come together into yeah. a single whole yep okay so we will bring this back next week for a formal vote to send on to the council um, in some sort of form that's similar to this. We are meeting the 23rd, yes. Um, so we are meeting a week from today because we're off schedule with this one because of last week's um, holidays. Um, so we'll come back then with the changes. I will keep the changes tracked so people can see what happened between what they saw this week and what they will see next week. Andy, it looks like you have a comment. Yeah, I mean, the other thing that John might, when oh, he yeah. comments on this, yes. speak to it too. Thank you. Whether the time um, goal that was put forward by the um, housing trust is really a realistic goal and what kind of flexibility is there because I think that we're, as a council, in our two committees in coming together and having council discussion and getting um, a final end product, we need to look as a council on how we can handle that. And there are other committees. Uh, when I uh, talked to the chair of the Community Preservation Act Committee, they hadn't yet had an initial discussion, and um, I don't think that the that as a committee that they had really focused on what was expected of them or what was being asked of them. Uh, so 
think this is a uh, thing that we need to look at the whole timeline. Yeah. So th thank you for a reminder, though. I had promised that since we had no public comment when we had public comment period and we now have public in the room, um, and this is the main thing I think people would want to comment on in our agenda. Is, is there any comments that the public would like to add at this time before we move on to our next agenda item? Sure, I okay, so, so Mr. Hornick, come on up and, and comment. Okay, thank you for your attention to this. I think you've given more attention to this than any of the groups that I've gone before so far, which I uh, definitely appreciate. Of course, the Housing Trust is very rigid and inflexible. We don't want any changes to this document. No. <laughs> Our goal is to strengthen the document, and these kinds of comments and discussions are necessary to that. Um, let me say a couple of things. I was a little surprised at the comment that families aren't indicated as important since the first bullet at the top of the second page in terms of priority populations is families. So I don't know what else we should do, but I'd certainly uh, be interested because I do think it's very important to have families. Um, I think some of Dorothy's comments about concern about what this housing could look like and how it could make our downtown look even worse are certainly important and something I sympathize with. Um, one of the things that the consultants who are working with the town on 40R are doing is developing design guidelines. And I think design guidelines, properly created and enforceable, should be the answer to the issues that you've raised. And uh, at least the first draft of those, or at least of the ideas, will be presented on October 24th, I think 6.30. Um, in the Woodbury Room at the uh, library. And so I would urge everybody to come because I think it's critical. And I think they're doing their best to do a good job of this because it really is important. If you, you know, we don't, none of us want the downtown to be simply overwhelmed by larger and larger buildings. That doesn't make sense. On the other hand, we do want housing that's sustainable, so that means to some extent building up and um, building more compact, and so I hope the answer is design guidelines. Um, Andy spoke about the need to be, these aren't, isn't his word, but opportunistic, to look for, uh, you know, the chances that are there when they occur to create development, and that's something that the town, particularly Town Hall, has done quite well in the past and that we, we need to continue to do. Um, however, each project, as it comes along, has unique issues and opportunities. So it's impossible to say, okay, how much is gonna involve uh, town surplus property, how much exactly are we going to expect from CPA or from some of the other sources. So I think, um, I, I don't think there's value, if you like, in trying to specify those things too closely. And it also is something that I'll be discussing with the Finance Committee, as Andy mentioned before. I did meet with CPA C last night and had an opportunity to talk with them about this. Um, I think maybe with the exception of Jim Oldham, people were saying, this is a lot for us to think about right now. We need some more time with it. Uh, part of that, and part of that is the fact that they are now um, virtually uh, about to embark on the new round of grant proposals. So making significant changes to what they have been doing honestly is not in the cards immediately. On the other hand, I think they're all interested in making certain kinds of changes, and I hope that comes about, but I think first they need to get past the current grant cycle, and then we can be in conversations 
um, CPA has been very supportive of uh, financing affordable housing. I did want to say a little bit about Mandy Joe's comment with respect to the university. I suppose if I personally were to draft something that went into this document related to the university, it might not be printable <laughs> at the current time. Um, just to briefly explain, uh, Nancy Buffone and Tony Marulis came to the housing trust meeting last Thursday night, and I realized that understanding their plan is like unpeeling an onion. You learn a little bit more each time you talk with somebody. Now, I know we all were excited that close to 1,000 new residential beds were going to be built on campus uh, within a couple of years or so. Well, it's not exactly true. The net new beds is quite a bit smaller. First of all, 300 of them are replacements for North Village and for Lincoln Apartments. And it also turns out that at the same time they open this new residence, they're planning on shutting down four to 500 beds in their existing dormitory space for renovation. So at the end of the day, what we're talking about is maybe a couple of hundreds net new beds. Uh, and as I've said, and you've all heard me say this, the gap between the number of students who are enrolled and the number of residential beds on campus is roughly 17,000. The university spokesperson will say, I'm overestimating, but even if it's 15,000, <laughs> it's a pretty big number, and it has a huge impact on our local market. Now, we could say that in this document. Um, on the other hand, those aren't policy statements, and you keep reminding me, Mandy Joe, that this is supposed to be a policy document. <laughs> I also want to remind everybody, as I'm constantly reminded, of uh, Alyssa Brewer's admonition, this thing's already too long. <laughs> uh, you got to figure out a way of shortening it up. So I think all of the things that people have recommended, for the most part, are things we should try to find a way to include, uh, and I do appreciate them. Um, but some, as I've suggested, may be harder than others. If any of you have any specific questions. Oh. I think for now, I think we're, we're good. Thank you for your comment. Oh, Andy. Oh, uh, oh, the, yeah, the, the, the five-year timeline. No, the, just that? the completion of oh. this process for the policy, whether the goal you had for getting everyone's comments back and then ultimately it is a council action whether the whole uh, process need, needs to be revisited so that we keep moving but at a realistic yeah. pace. It's a, it's a good comment, Andy, and it reminds me of something else I intended to say. Um, as a couple of people have said, there are zoning issues involved here, and I've met with the planning board once, and I'm scheduled, I think, to meet with them again in mid-November, um, which, of course, is later than both finance and community resources are, have been meeting. Uh, my sense is that there are at least two members of the planning board that want to change at least the inclusionary zoning bylaw, which again has been something discussed here, um, and that that might well go in as a policy piece of the policy, and there may be other things that they decide to do. So to the extent that we can, I guess I feel less stress about this has got to be done by Thanksgiving than that it really should reflect the thinking of the various town boards and councils so that we do have a policy that we all feel that we can work with and we can work on together. So uh, what that means is I'm reluctant at this moment in time to give a timeline. I do appreciate the attention that's gotten from town council and we'll continue to work with CPAC and the planning board um, to get their thoughts as quickly as I can. Do 
Does that answer it, Mindy? Okay. So thank you, Mr. Hornick. Um, we are going to move on to our next discussion item, which is um, something that one of our members asked to put on the agenda, which is a potential community resources retreat. Um, so I'd like Pat, who asked us to put this on the agenda, to talk about what her thinking is about the potential for this and what it could accomplish and what it might do, and then we can discuss whether, as a committee, we want to go forward with trying to schedule something. I think, for me, the idea um, of a retreat would enable us to collaborate and come forward with a process that we would use um, and also allow us to address uh, how are we going to um, collaborate and uh, with other committees um, and I have, how will we use liaisons, where will we get information. But I also feel like, you know, there's been some r rough rides and um, I'm thinking about um, losing Sarah, who was an important member of the committee, and whether or not there's some, just some personal work that we might need to do as a group of five to come together. So uh, that's about. So I am interested in hearing the other members' thoughts on holding a retreat um, and what, if they want to hold one, what it might also include, now that we've heard what Pat is thinking. Well, I could see, not this, this is not the same thing she's proposing, but like a, a study retreat where we deal with the important documents that we're supposed to have mastered and go through them in detail with help and then sit down and talk about it. So it's, it's more of an academic, I think she was talking about more of a personal thing, but I'm thinking of an academic thing where I could, I could really, I would really enjoy getting deeply immersed into um, all of the, the planning, the master plan, the housing documents, so that we all talk about it, go over it, get lectures on it, respond on it, and come out of it feeling like, okay, now I know what we're, where we're, what we're supposed to be doing. The idea of a retreat, uh, I think it's important to go beyond the word and say what it is that we want to accomplish. My observation about this committee is that the challenge that we've had is, is that it's sort of become the catch-all committee. Anything that didn't get assigned to another committee got assigned to this one, and it makes for a very broad and unfocused set of uh, priorities and um, assignments and that we've been trying to work at understanding what it all what everything is that's assigned to us and put some order to it the retreat might offer a little bit of a more unstructured opportunity to look at all of those different areas that um, we might enumerate as being uh, within the responsibility of this committee and uh, to pick up on things that have been previously said, what kinds of documents pertain to it, what other committees that um, we would need to work with in order to um, move these um, issues forward and what are the um, underlying community and council values that need to be um, incorporated in all of our work. Um, I'm glad Darcy's here because Darcy always is my reminder that we need to be thinking about our energy goals and uh, that uh, what we do in 
the various things that we talk about when it comes to planning and uh, transportation, all of the other things that may fall into this committee's purview that we need to be thinking about what are the core values, and that's one of them, that uh, reducing our uh, footprint on greenhouse gas emissions is, uh, I think, always has to be there is something that we at least consider in every discussion that we have, and there are others. I, mean, I, I didn't mean to pick on that one in particular, but um, Garcia's being here reminded, reminds me of it, and so I thank you for being here. My second meeting, <laughs> so I, I have, I'm trying Chair. to figure out everything right now. Um, what I'm hearing is that people are think it's a good idea to have a retreat. Is I think what I've heard from everyone, um, even if there are different ideas as to what that might include. So I think that requires me to come back and come up with a potential plan, um, maybe pull for dates. Um, or maybe try and set aside one of our upcoming meetings as a two-hour discussion of things that could maybe serve as a retreat. Um, so, so I think what I need to do is come back, c think about how to fit that into our schedule without overburdening us counselors. Um, can it fit into a different meeting? Um, what it would look like? Um, what we might what that format might look like, what might be on that agenda, um, and come up with a proposal to bring back here to get everyone's yes, that, that sounds good before we go ahead and schedule it. Although maybe come up with a, a time and then work toward an agenda that, that everyone is comfortable with. Is, does, does that sound like a way forward? Dorothy. Um, I went with it except for set aside a meeting. I don't think setting aside, um, setting aside a meeting would do what it is that we need to have done. First of all, I would prefer to be sitting uh, in a much more informal manner, not at 8.30 in the morning, probably on the weekend. I think uh, a feeling of a little more time is, is necessary, uh, a little bit more spread out. There, as, as Andy said, we, we the phrase catch-all committee sounds like we're not really important, but you could also say we're the heart committee. We're, we're everything that really matters, except financial matters, comes together. We can't disband the finance committee, Pat. Um, <laughs> but, okay, so, so what I'm hearing is potentially a weekend, but, but longer than two hours at least longer than two hours. Um, I, I am concerned about, I, I will state frankly as chair, I'm concerned about a weekend meeting for a number of reasons, staff time, but also counselor time. Um, you know, having a child weekends with family become important and we're already looking at multiple council meetings in, in November on the weekends. Um, yeah, Pat. Um, <clears throat> I feel strongly that um, maybe there wasn't enough emphasis on how do we work? What is the process that we will use moving forward? Um, I think that really needs to be discussed. Um, and uh, so uh, that feels important. And I had one other thing, but I can't remember what it is right now. Oh, uh, if uh, Dorothy, I, I, if you want to get together and we can read the master plan together or talk about issues in it, I'd be happy to do that. Um, it's an interesting document, and I think in several of our earlier meetings when we were had Christine here and stuff, we were we brought forward things that we thought needed to be included, sustainability issues and different things. So we I have that list, um, and we can look at it for that as well, if that's something you're interested in. I think there's a tentative plan. I'll probably try and send out some dates sometime um, and see if we can get something. I'm, I don't think 
October or November and maybe even December are even possible. So I think we're probably looking in January just due to council schedules. Um, yeah. Yes. It, it has, it, all five of us would have to be available. With that, we will move on on our agenda. Yeah, let me oh, just, sum, yep. just summarize this a bit. I think what we were talking, what we seem to be talking about is a retreat that allows us to look at what are the most important goals for this committee, what documents um, we need to be aware of and understand, but also we, I want to add one to that, and that is what are the boards and committees, both of the council and the town, um, are partners that we need to work with um, and uh, need to develop those relationships, understand those relationships. What are the underlying values of the council and, and the community that um, need to be considered within our work and then the um, issue that uh, Pat's raised several times, and that is uh, process. What is our committee process in order to address all of the um, goals that we put forward with the committee as this co continues? Thanks for the summary. We have no action items. We have no presentations. That brings us to minutes. Um, there are, I, I set these up because of how the prior committee I was chairing operated. I have been informed that CRC might have adopted a, a different means of approving minutes. And I just want to, um, the former chair, Steve, indicated to me that CRC's policy was to put the minutes out there if no one commented and had any changes, they were just deemed approved like a week or so later. Um, I'm concerned about that process because you can't guarantee everyone's read them um, as chair. And when I went back to read minutes to figure out what had potentially been approved or not, um, there were a number of minutes from months ago that did not seem complete. Um, and so, I don't know whether we want to revisit how to do it. I have two items on minutes. Number one is last week's, the September 25 minutes, and I think the August um, 18, is that the right date? 21, 21, August 21 minutes for approval because those were the most two, the two most recent that I had seen. Um, we can approve them by vote today if people want to. We could do it by consensus. Um, if anyone's not read them, we can postpone them a week and then I want to talk about process for past minutes to see where people stand on whether they should be approved and how and then maybe process for going forward um, so do we want to just start with those two sets of minutes that I specifically set forth and put in the packet and even though CRC might have a different process vote on them today to have a clear record of them being approved in some have a clear record of that and then move on to getting to a clear record of past appro past minutes approved. Does that sound like a plan? I, I would would like to delay it a week. The, the minutes? I, I, I haven't read the new okay. ones. I hadn't accessed the packet. Okay. So we will delay approval of the September 25th and August, sorry, September 25th and August 23rd. I was doing them in the wrong order. <laughs> yeah, August 21st, September 25th. Those two. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, we will postpone those until next week. Uh, you were going to give me a list of meetings where there were no minutes, and I was going to reconstruct from my notes. So that, that's the next part of this discussion on minutes, which is um, I could not tell that minutes had been approved of any prior meeting before I took over chair. As I said, Steve, the former chair, 
indicated to me that this committee had agreed to an approval by consensus. I think I would like some sort of um, notation somewhere, whether it be as we go forward an agreement on which ones have been approved by consensus or which ones aren't, or a one, one idea I had was to designate a member of CRC to um, formally go through all prior minutes and approve them or identify those that aren't exist in existence. Um, after I talked to you, Dorothy, I talked to Mr. Zomek, and he seemed to think they all exist, but I just might not have been able to find them all, um, <laughs> which might be the case. Um, and so it, 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 just, it might just be that I couldn't locate them. Um, but to designate a member to go through them and, and say, yes, these are complete and can be approved, or hey, maybe we need to deal with a little bit, these specific ones a little bit more. Um, and so that would be for everything before August 21st. Um, is that something this committee would be okay with doing, designating one member, which is allowed under public records law and open meeting law to do, to go through and do that? I would say it would be okay as long as that member, who is not going to be me, um, would reach out when in doubt. Yes. Um, Pat, you had your hand raised. I was just going to uh, say that I think it's a good idea to do that process and then move forward with a new process. Okay. So do and I, I don't want to do it either. <laughs> I was hoping you might be willing to. I, I don't foresee a strict timeline on this, I must say, um, because there are a lot of minutes. Um, I, I don't feel like I am capable of it because I was not at any of the meetings. Only if the committee takes me out to lunch when it's finally done. <laughs> <laughs> Andy's chairing another committee. <laughs> Pat, would you uh, be willing right. to take that on? Yeah. So I'm probably going to whine about it periodically. So do I hear a motion to designate um, Pat DeAngelis as the CRC member to review and approve all minutes of meetings prior to August 21st, 2019, and bring to the chair's attention any minutes that she believes need additional attention. So moved. Second. Did our, our recorder get that motion? Awesome. <laughs> Any discussion? All those in favor? Raise your hand. All those against? All those abstaining? Are, did you vote yes? Okay. <laughs> so that is 4-0 with one absence. Okay, so the next one that I'm adding to the agenda is process for minute approval for those minutes moving forward. I guess that would include August 21st and September 25th if we want to start at that point. Do we want to have formal votes at every meeting? Um, or do we want to continue now that we have a minute taker with one person designated to review them and then say they are approved? And then the goal would be at a meeting report which ones have been approved so that we can get that to the correct staff for publication. Yes, Dorothy. Uh, I think I'd like to take a minute, once we have the control, to ask if the minutes are approved because that prompts people's memory if there's something that they need to add or ask a question about. But it should go very quickly. Pat? I agree with you. So I'm hearing, uh, Andy, do you have any thoughts? Okay, so I'm hearing there's some desire to have an agenda item with a, a quick vote and just to confirm it going forward. So that's what we will do. Um, we will keep up with it. Every meeting we'll, we'll head for the prior meetings minutes and, and take a vote. August 21st, September 25th, and 
given that the meeting is next week, I know our minute takers are very quick, but I'm not going to put that on you as it may not, we'll probably wait till the meeting after for, for those. Um, so, so we won't be looking at today's minutes, although we may have them in draft form at some point, we'll, we won't put that on the agenda to approve. We'll be looking at September 25 and August 21. Okay. Um, I don't think there's anything else related to minutes. Announcements, um, I wanted to, and then there are some items here un unanticipated by the chair, which are mainly housekeeping stuff. But announcement wise, I am in the process when I do agendas for committees, I try to keep a li running list of what might be coming up the process um, so that people on the committee and also those in the public have an idea of what's coming um, my computer is being slow right now so um, what I am looking at right now as and I just want to go through some of this so people know what's going on next week we are trying I'm working with mr. Zomack and trying to get a joint meeting of this committee and the Transportation Advisory Committee in order to deal with and at least discuss the referral on the MGL Chapter 90, Section 17C and 18B speed limit issue. Um, they have a meeting scheduled for next Wednesday at 7 p.m. We have one scheduled for next Wednesday at 8.30 in the morning. We don't have confirmation at this point as to whether their members can make our 8.30 a.m. meeting um, I am curious whether our members could make a 7 p.m. meeting or potentially start earlier because their meeting's going to, I assume, will have other day. Just reread the email from Guilford Morin this morning, um, and I misread it early this morning. I think they start at 5 and end by 7. Oh, okay. So, um, so there's a possibility of of joining them if their agenda is not too full. So would a five to seven potentially starting earlier or going later so that we're there for half of their meeting and then we continue ours, if they cannot join us at 8.30 in the morning, would a five to seven on Wednesday be doable, Pat? It's doable, but I would have a hard stop at seven no matter what, because okay. I have a commitment from seven to nine. They meet in this room, and the Conservation Commission meets at 7, so they really, they're, it's a very hard stop. In fact, I think it's prior to 7, so. so what, Dorothy, you're saying that 5 to 7 would not be possible for you, or earlier than 5 to then go to 5 and whenever? Okay. Okay. <laughs> This is why I'm asking, so Andy, this would be the 23rd, one week from today. I'm trying to probe a little bit on that because Clearly, they have other business. Yes. This wouldn't be their whole meeting. Right. It might be part of their meeting. If we were, would it, uh, I didn't hear the specifics, Dorothy, would it help to be earlier or later or later? So what I'm suggesting is maybe I could work with Guilford Mooring to say, could, could we have this joint discussion from 6 to 6.45 and they do their other business from 5 or 5.30 whenever they begin? Would that be helpful or is... That's not going to help you. So potentially a 6 p.m. start for us might be possible? Yeah. Okay. And Andy says yes. We don't obviously know Steve. Um, 6.45 feels too late because of 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. No, no, no. I said from no, 6, 6, to 6, 6 to 6.45. 6 to yeah. 6.45. Yeah. Um, so I will continue exploring that with 
with Dave and, and all to see. The, the general, the draft agenda has that on it, this housing priorities policy final vote, which means if we're doing something joint at night, we might have to be here in the morning or postpone it to the November 6th meeting because it sounds like finance, I, I, I'd, I'd have to talk to Lynn on when she's putting it on our council agenda. Um, and then minutes and the only other thing was potentially since we would have Guilford in the room and Tack in the room, I could work with them as maybe having a conversation on between the two committees on how we can work together um, on transportation issues and, and where those those lines lie, but that would, might not be possible given time frames, but but we'll, we'll see. I'll try and do something so that we're not here both at 8.30 and at six or something, but pay attention to your email. <laughs> it's my announcement on that, yes. A, a stream of consciousness. Um, crossings, this is about not killing people when they try to cross the street. Uh, I have a very hard time driving through Amherst because I can't see the people at the crosswalks. And I can't make them wear white clothes or a glow-in-the-dark stripe. So I think we need more light at crosswalks, even right downtown, right here. Uh, driving home the other day, I remember it's thinking, saying to Bob, slow down, you can't see the people at all. So it, it's a problem. It's a, it's a really big problem. I said, this is a pedestrian town. There's always somebody trying to cross in a crosswalk, but it's very dark. So save that thought for when we are discussing transportation. <laughs> And the, to give you an idea of what else is coming up, um, the council has their October 28th meeting on the master plan. It's a public forum required by the charter on the master plan in about a week and a half, 10 days. So that means there could be a referral from that meeting to us to discuss updates to the master plan. That discussion would start on November 6th um, for how that might happen. And we are set to bring back Archipelago Investments and the Spring Street redesign and parking on November 6th is the tentative date, but that might get pushed depending on stuff since we know it's not as time urgent now, oops and all, um, but that is a tentative November 6th date um, and all. So that's the tentative schedule coming up for people to know about announcement wise. Um, items not anticipated, which is, which I will move on to, which is basically how to get packet information to this committee efficiently, um, but also so that everyone is ready in time. The goal is to have the packet information out a week before the meeting um, so that it gives everyone time. I will try my hardest to make sure that is possible. Um, I have always used SharePoint to get that information out. It sounds like that um, is a struggle for some people. And so I'd like some help on how best to disseminate that information, number one. Um, and I, I have a couple of options. And number two, um, staff is looking for some guidance on what needs to be in paper day of the meeting, too what needs to be in paper at our tables day of meeting. Do people need paper copies of stuff for the meeting or is a SharePoint or an online distribution sufficient? Is, is staff is looking for guidance? I have a mixed reaction to that because mostly I've gotten very used to reading now and, and the laptop and it does save paper, but there are sometimes documents or something that's coming up. Like it's great to have the Hickory Ridge map uh, things like that. So um, I don't know how to, but I don't think in general we need to have everything coming to us. No, I, I think we can, if I could, we can play that a little by ear. Um, clearly when there are guests, whether it's Archipelago, we will ask them to bring, you know, visuals for you to see. I think as our meetings um, take on some some more uh, some meatier topics. I, I suspect we'll have some audience members who will want to see what we're talking about, whether it's a, a policy document earlier or a map or a, a plan of some sort. You know, looking at an intersection or whatever it might be. Um, so we'll, we'll play that by ear a little bit. 
And um, yeah, I think. Uh, I use paper if I can find documents. I print them at home. Um, I use this when I can't see the screen um, because I can't see, I can't read it half the time. So I am a paper person and I really do like paper. I also like links. I don't know how to make a link, but I know how to push a link. And um, when you send me a document, send me a link and I'll get it and then I print it. So if I can, like this week I sent out an email that said find it on SharePoint. If I can link to that folder on SharePoint, you can access the documents? Okay, because <laughs> I think I can create those links pretty easily. Um, instead of just saying find it there, I think I can create a link that says here's the link to the packet materials and then you'd be good. Does that work for everyone if I can create a link to just attach a link into an email? Okay. Margaret did links and I always liked that. Um, and you can send them to me if you, and I can post them to SharePoint. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what I will do to notify people is I'll send an email that has a link to a packet. Um, or specific documents. It sounds like a number of us, if we're dealing with a plot plan or some sort of real visual picture versus just a document with words, that that is helpful to have projected on a screen potentially, but also maybe in paper form because it's easier and bigger at that point. Um, any other suggestions for how to make these meetings run well and have everyone informed about what's going on well in advance. Not seeing any, so that's what we'll go with. If people run into problems, feel free to talk to me um, and say I need more help or I need it done differently and I'll. And you're gonna, you're gonna be really good about sending them out early, which is great. I'm gonna try. <laughs> but then send out the one the day before, the reminder with a link because I get so much email um, that things get lost and things move very fast here uh, with all the different committees. So if you send it so that we can get it and read it and then remind us to do it. Okay. Any other? Andy? It, it, this isn't done um, specifically on this topic, but it's related, and that is, I think that just, uh, I'd like to have a little bit more of a sense, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, coming agenda items and where we're um, headed on certain things, at least to know that they're coming up. Um, for example, uh, parking. Or do we have a plan for when we're going to talk about parking just so we know about it? Uh, we know it's coming. That's that's in and of itself helpful. So, the agenda. If you open up an agenda and page down on your current agenda, go to a second page. That will have scheduled and non-scheduled upcoming agenda items. I will try to keep that up to date for something like parking. I know I I have a feeling it will come be referred to this committee when a final report comes out to the council. I just don't know when they're going to issue that final report, so I can't tentatively schedule it for a meeting yet. Um, you'll see on the tentative on next week's tentative schedule. It's missing some now that climate action goals, as recommended by ECAC, if they're referred by the council on November 18th. I hope to discuss them at our November 20th meeting. That obviously might change, and I will try and keep that list updated as much as possible. It's also where un under the unscheduled items, I will put anything people from the committee mention about future agenda items um, so that we have, it's my way of not losing track of agenda items people would like to talk about too. Um, and so at any meeting, at any time, someone can say, hey, this one's been on the unscheduled list for months can we move it to a scheduled item or can we put it on an agenda and I will make note of that too. Does that sound 
like you were looking for, Andy? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so that's, that's where it'll be um, for anyone to look for. Okay. With that, I think any other items not anticipated by myself 48 hours in advance? Uh, no, I just want to, uh, I just have a, uh, uh, it's not an item, so I'm not, I will not be here on the 6th. I will be at a, a retreat around food access. Just to let people know now. That, but I, you know, if I have documents in advance, then I could send you comments if I have them. Then. Seeing nothing else, does this committee like to move to adjourn or do they like the chair to declare it adjourned? I will just declare it adjourned, our meeting adjourned at 10.13 a.m.